Europe, especially in England. They were very influential back in England, so they could actually put pressure on the the Queen and get things done in favor of the 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 lower caste people in in Travancore. So that is the reason many of them converted to uh, Church of Missionary Society and all that, not Roman Catholics. Um, but then um, these missionaries, you know, who came from European countries like uh, German, Germany, England, and all, uh, they saw a business opportunity in Travancore after the abolition of the slavery. They were very benevolent at the same time. Um, they also focused on doing some business in that, you know, the region. Um, <clears throat> they started uh, coffee plantations in high range areas like Munar and all. Uh, it's interesting that most of the plantations were owned by missionaries, Christian missionaries. Okay, anyway, that is not the, <laughs> it is not very related to what I want to talk about. Now, the the person that I want to talk about is called Poigei Leohannan. So he was he did not um, face slavery because he was born towards the end of the uh, 20th century, uh, sorry, 19th century. So he did not uh, face slavery, but I, I'm sure he belonged to the second generation, the first generation after the abolition of the slavery. So as any other untouchable family would do they sent him to a missionary school for education and he showed more interest in you know learning about his community's history and all he was educated he started reading bible and then he joined a church called the marthoma church uh, which was supposedly established by uh, saint thomas right yeah it's a syrian christian church and he was allowed to uh, be a member of the church which was not very common at that point of time. And he was a good speaker, apparently. He used to sing well and all that. There were many other uh, you know, uh, untouchable people, members of the church. So uh, apparently when one, uh, one of the, uh, you know, one uh, untouchable lady died, the upper caste members of the church did not allow them, her family to bury her in the common burial ground they in fact buried yeah sorry they buried but they forced them to exhume the body and bury it in a separate place so Johannan, being very conscious about his community and and their rights made it a big issue and then he left the church along with uh, uh, many of his followers and then he joined church missionary society cms and then from there again he was facing problems there and then then he moved to moved on to join another uh, church okay so this happened for some time but at the same time he became although he started his career as a christian preacher he became very critical about uh, christianity itself okay so when i say that he became critical about christianity it is not coming from a uh, uh, you know anti-christian point of view okay so let me make it very clear that it's not a you know right-wing hindu perspective he became uh, he became very critical about christianity for for uh, various other reasons an organic intellectual people worship him as their prophet now a god uh, he did a very smart thing okay so what he did is he used the you know the christian theology to make his people understand what is slavery and what is redemption so he he is very proficient in, in in bible because he was a preacher so he said we also suffered slavery right the jews also suffered but their god came to redeem them from slavery right and we are reading about their redemption every day and night hoping that one day the same God will come and redeem us, but it's not going to happen because the book is about someone else. It's not ours. So he used to read chapter by chapter and tell them that this chapter is written to a particular group, not about the Pulayas or Parayas or Mahadigas or Malas of our land. It's not about us. So we need to understand our history. There is an absence of history in this text. So what happened to our ancestors? We need to find out. So 
he will sing songs instantly while preaching the people are very proficient in biblical stories so the song sounds like as if he is praising jesus christ but in fact it is not he was asking questions to them uh so and um, uh, so the absence of history was the major uh, the contention of yohanan in his preachings so he then retold the history of travancore incorporating slavery and redemption with the biblical themes okay that is the interesting aspect of this moment he said our ancestors suffered slavery we can expect redemption but not through christianity okay i am the the prophet god has sent okay the god so you are suffering so god has sent me to redeem you to take you to he didn't promise them heaven that is another interesting thing he clearly told them that there is no heaven it's a it's a very false notion heaven is in this world and if you want to enjoy heaven you need to have education you need to have property he did not promise them heaven or anything unlike bible <clears throat> okay so uh, i will talk little more about his songs later on a uh, couple of songs all the songs are in malayalam it's not translated into um, i mean there are no malayalam speakers there even if i sing raju wanted me to sing but i can't sing <laughs> so those songs are very political we understand today that the songs that he sang in the you know the early phase of 20th century were very political today when the subaltern historians are trying to trying to write the history of the the marginalized we realized that poigel yohannan spoke about it 100 years ago removing certain political uh, edges of uh, you know the heroic uh, dorcas uh, ballad heroes uh, intervention so uh, why did i mention this so there are two things one is about the uh, way in which dalit christian theology has uh, tried to engage with uh, caste Uh, so we have in the 1980s 1990s uh, we have uh, people like our uh, James Theophilus Apau uh, who used for instance uh, the folk music traditions the folk uh, say songs uh, and especially the instrument pare uh, or drum uh, which is uh, a symbol of uh, caste association or caste association so uh, when you look at those there are uh, interesting uh, ethno music works on uh, uh, apau so you can see that the image of the drum the the way in which pop music was incorporated to say uh, christian theological uh, reflections all of these things uh, in a way uh, contextualized uh, the theological understanding so we are talking about people like the theologians like uh, the apau who were trying to bring together say aspects from liberation theology aspects from uh, several other kinds of thinking about the region about experiences etc and giving it a very local flavor so uh, the study that i am talking about also talks about how about for instance uh, develop this concept of uh, uru ole where people interact so that is again so breaking all these caste norms caste myths became very important <coughs> in the uh, tamil dalit christian scene in the 80s so interdining interdining not just sharing the food but you know cooking food uh, at different places in different homes bringing it together mixing it together and eating the same food which would you know which would mean that we are all the same so there were these deliberate attempts to uh, i would say uh, create new legends about how the lorcas community understood christianity uh, say in tamil nadu uh, though the travancore region that uh, avilash was mentioning is again very close to uh, you know uh, the tamil culture or uh, parts of us while travancore would right now fall under tamil nadu there was a different kind of a, uh, i would say uh, trajectory in travancore when it comes to say lower caste conversion so i will mention uh, a few things about how say the songs uh, 
uh, especially Dalit Christian songs, and as Abhinash was mentioning, this uh, engagement with slave history happened uh, in Travancore. So this is the Tamil Nadu scene that I mentioned is from the 80s. Uh, it's a more informed, more contemporary intervention where uh, like people engage in theology, it's engaging with Indian Christian theology. And if you, if you know, there are texts of Indian Christian theology which they follow in several of our uh, theological seminaries where uh, it's largely to do with the Hindu, Sanskrit, Brahminical uh, philosophies. So there's a, there's a radical shift from such ideas and trying to make it more contextual, uh, some even refer to it as indigenizing it. So when it comes to uh, Kerala, with the intervention of the London Missionary uh, Society in South Travancore and the uh, Church Missionary Society in Central Travancore, what has happened was, as Abner said, uh, with the advent of colonial modernity, we had uh, social mobility in some sense. But there's also the other side of the story where this particular engagement of Dalits or missionaries with Dalits uh, was uh, you know, being brought down or there were attempts to bring it down as uh, you know, mere association for material benefits. So you, I think in Andhra also we have this concept of the rice Christians where uh, Dalits have been accused in that sense of converting only for uh, material benefits. But there are several other uh, examples from the Dalit Christian history, especially in the forms of uh, form of songs, I would say, which would refute these kinds of arguments as well. So uh, since Ablash mentioned the abolition of slavery, I will probably read the translation of uh, one of the uh, songs, which was um, written by a missionary William uh, uh, Fletcher. This is um, in the late 19, uh, sorry, 1800s, and the the Malayalam version was called Adimavela Oriyu, which means uh, slavery is over. So, how these kinds of themes, how these kinds of experiences, which were very close to the uh, everyday life of the uh, the Dalit converts or the Dalit Christians became important in their songs. And these songs, um, if you look at the history of uh, missionary activities in Kerala, you can also see that most of the things that they wanted to convey were also conveyed through songs. And people would remember the songs easily. People wanted those songs. Uh, so songs and stories and these performances could actually uh, get people to the fold is also another thing. So I would read this uh, Song. Our slave work is done, our slave bonds are gone. For this we shall never henceforth forsake thee for Jesus. To purchase cattle, fields, houses, and many luxuries we were sold. Now Messiah himself has settled in the land a people who once fled in terror. The father was sold to one place, the mother to another, the children also separated, but now the honours who enslaved us often causes much suffering, but will it comfort us to relate all the oppression in full? After exhaustion with labour in burning heat, in rain and cold and dew, they bet us cruelly with thousands of straws. Dogs might enter streets, markets, courts and lands, but if we went near, they bet and chased us to a distance. So the song is there in the... Uh, <coughs> Uh, Samuel Matthew's work uh, from the 1800s, uh, 1880s. But the interesting thing is that this kind of a song will not make sense to that upper caste Christian community that Abhilash was mentioning earlier, the Syrian Christian community in Kerala, because that slavery was not part of their lived experience. Slavery was uh, what uh, you know benefited them. Uh, so even the Yohanna, the Poigir Yohanna or Kumari Gurudev that Abhilash mentioned, his family uh, had that history of being uh, the slaves of a Syrian Christian family there. So that is why it's very uh, interesting to understand how complicated, you know, caste was or caste still is in Christianity in Kerala. So the uh, the, the, the so-called uh, normal, original, ordinary, traditional Christian is the upper caste Syrian Christian, whereas 
uh, Dalit conversions happen pretty late. The way uh, Dalit Christians engage with Christianity in Kerala during the colonial times is also the fact that where right now we understand that we don't need to abandon everything uh, our own, all our traditions to accept something uh, foreign or something Western. Uh, during this period, uh, you know, scholars also refer to this as linguistic modernity, where the Dalit Christians in Kerala could actually use the so-called standard Malayalam or upper caste Malayalam and sing songs in that language. So in that sense, you're also subverting the language itself and not using, uh, say, caste-related language. Uh, why am I saying this? Uh, we can understand this if we look at the kind of terms that were actually sanctioned, uh, say, for use by the Dalit Christians. So if you're a Dalit in colonial Kerala, you're not supposed to talk about yourself or your family or your children or anything that you have using the same terms that an upper caste would use. Whereas a Syrian Christian could do all of those things. Syrian Christians could, like what you know was mentioned in the song, Syrian Christians could walk the road, uh, they could take the public road without any trouble. Dalit Christians or Dalits could not. So there was that kind of a, a difference as well. So in one sense, when the Dalit Christians started using uh, these songs in the so-called upper caste or standard Malayalam, that itself was, you know, challenging the, the caste norms in terms of the use of language itself. So that is something that uh, we can again mention. And again, as I said, the themes, uh, the anti-slavery, anti-caste uh, uh, themes in these songs, then uh, the kind of memories that they would want, uh, you know, alive through these songs. It's not that uh, they wanted to forget the slave past, but that's uh, again another thing about uh, Apachin songs. I'm sure Abhilash will talk about it. Uh, this entire memory of slavery is kept alive in these songs. And um, both Dalit Christians and I would say uh, whatever I've understood from Apachin songs and uh, that history would use certain things. For instance, the, the story of Moses from the Old Testament, you know, how Moses. Uh, liberated the uh, Israelites from Egypt. So that kind of a history is often invoked uh, in all of these stories, all of these songs. Uh, so in that sense, there is uh, definitely, I would say uh, that Dalit Christian theological, uh, you know, intervention alive from the colonial times. And the Pogiela Pachin was very much, uh, I would say, at least initially a part of that, but he moved further is, uh, is one thing. Yeah, several of these songs, yeah, it's interesting. Several of these songs written by missionaries or by Dalit Christians, uh, like you had it in both English and in Malayalam. Uh, yeah, Ayeyo Devame. Uh, yeah, Ayeyo Devame, uh, translated as Oh God. Oh God, hear our heartbreaking cries cleared forest and made it into land. We made our small hearts as home. These people are thrown into the wilderness, half dead and half alive. Made to plow fields, yoked with bull and oxen. When they became frail, beaten to death and buried. So this is also again important because even uh, PRDS or Poigil uh, Apachin's Pratyaksha Raksha Deva Sabha, they involve this memory. I think every year they do this, right? Every year they do this. So this is talking about instances where even the missionaries have accounts of this, where Dalits were tied to the plough along with the uh, uh, bulls or uh, buffaloes and made to plough the field. So, so there were such traditions. So that is why this question of slavery is very important. And uh, there are accounts of how families were separated, husbands sold to one person, wives sold to another person, children sold to someone else, uh, existence of uh, slave markets, etc. So these are things that we generally do not talk about uh, when we discuss caste even. So those things uh, happen. Lord of creation heard our cries on the cross, showed us the path of mercy, and we remember the color of his mercy, uh, fell down fatigued with the heavy load, fell down exhausted, found too frail and beaten up mercilessly, bundled together and thrown into the wild, half alive and half dead, 
Six days after delivery, mother went out for work, left the sleeping baby under the shade of a tree, returned to find and eaten remains. Lord of creation heard our cries on the cross, showed us the path of mercy, and we remember the color of his mercy. Europeans came among us, slaves were freed with gospel. I suppose song, song is the one, the connecting thread, I suppose, for whatever we have been speaking. And uh, it's important to keep in mind that songs are not written, as you're mentioning. You know, the Dalits, for a long time, did not have access to the word, to the literate um, medium. And uh, all these songs, they're actually uh, collected, and then they were transcribed, and then that's, they're, they're available to us, not, not only in regional languages, but uh, in English now. So. Particularly, I'll be speaking about uh, a particular song, uh, Gadda's song. Um, uh, it's called Oh My Garbage Dump. I, we, I, I, I think to this audience, I don't need to speak uh, much about Gadar. Yeah, because I assume that most of you know uh, who Gadar was, his political trajectory from radical left, uh, his active involvement in the Telangana movement, and then his transition to the Ambedkarite movement and constitutional politics and so on. And if you want to discuss more, we can uh, certainly discuss um, about it later. But this particular song, uh, Oh My Garbage Don't, um, I look at this particular song as to how um, uh, the song as a medium is also um, uh, how, how gathered through this song basically um, challenges the idea of beauty and so on and in that sense it's a it's 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 an anti anti caste aesthetic that gets reflected in this particular song and then it's it's a resistance to caste system in, in that way so often as it is the case that you know seeds soil you know uh, rice fields and so on these are strong motives in Gada's song and this and in this particular song oh my garbage dump um, I read it as a polyphonic mirror. It's a mirror that reflects many aspects of Indian society. So one of the recurring themes in this particular song is the idea of uh, inclusivity, you know, the idea of being egalitarian. So it's a radical reimagination of a garbage dump, what I call the aesthetics of dirt and so on. So, you know, as, as, many, as all of you, I would, I would assume, know how caste system itself is it is built on the very idea of inequality, not just inequality, but graded inequality, as Ambedkar says, and demarcation of many kinds, demarcation of gender, of caste, caste within caste, and so on. So in that way, if we keep this in mind and read Gadda's poem, Oh My Garbage Dumb, which was published uh, in uh, the on anthology uh, that was uh, published by OUP, I think you have one of those copies and it's being sold outside, uh, whoever wants to buy a copy. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, Oxford Anthology. Uh, yeah, press. it's, it's, it's uh, been um, published there. So if you read this particular poem against this background, against this background where caste system demarcates, caste system discriminates, and caste system um, allows some to be pure and others to condemns others to be impure, permanently polluted, and so on. So in this particular song, what happens is Gadar sings a pian, basically, to the garbage dump. And then he says that, you know, it's like garbage dump is the space where uh, everyone is included. You know, if you look, look at it rhetorically, I mean, garbage dump, it's generally at the margin of society or at the margin of city and so on. And whatever is thrown into the garbage dump, it, 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 in that way, it, the garbage dump accepts it if we look at it that way, which is very radical if we posit it against the caste system. So garbage dump is a space where, you know, everything is thrown into it and then the garbage dump accepts it. And it's not just the things, even animals, you know, animals like pigs and cows, they go there, they eat whatever has been done there. So again, this, again, in the caste system, we have or not only people who are kind of uh, put into great uh, inequality, even animals, you know, pigs and dogs are at the uh, so-called outcast, so to speak, uh, as compared to cows and so on. So in this particular song, Gadda sings as to how it's not just pigs and dogs that find their food and nourishment in the garbage dump, even cows, cows 
you know, obviously you know the politics around cows and so on, but even cows, so-called so sacred animal and so on, they also find their space. It also find, finds its space in the garbage dump. So in that way, it's not just things, random things, you know, inanimate objects that are thrown into the garbage dump and then the garbage dump accepts it. Even animals, even animals are accepted into the garbage dump. Again, uh, garbage dump, he also kind of imagines the garbage dump uh, as an untouchable fire. You know, th again, it's like it comes from his uh, politics of, um, his radical pol politics, I would say, you know, the idea of fire, the idea, idea of inflammation and so on you know, burning down the system and so on. So I think that it comes from that tradition and so on. So he imagines this particular garbage dump as a space where, you know, many, many of must you must have seen how garbage dumps can, you know, because of the chemical reaction or whatever, they burn for days, you know, burn for days. I mean, it's like uh, smokes rising from the garbage dump and so on. So that he draws on that, ima that, that image, garbage dumps being burn and then you know perpetually burning and you know smokes rising out of it and so on and he says that it is it is the garbage dump is the very sign of revolution that is what he says you know many many find inspiration in this garbage dump and it is although in 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 in, in um, it, it's a it's, it's a dirty space so to so to speak it is also a space where the revolution is burning that is what he that is how he imagines it so I think uh, these are um, a couple of points that I wanted to make. Uh, I would certainly be more than happy to answer any question regarding this particular song or uh, any question um, regarding Godar and so on. Before I uh, hand over the mic, I'll make another point. Gopal Guru, in his um, in his in one of his articles, Rejection of Rejection, he says that Dalits Dalits are deprived of many things, material things, and even in, in societal terms, they are, de they are deprived of many things. So whatever they're deprived in the material domain, they compensate it in the literary domain. That is what he says. And here we, in Gar Oh My Garbage Don Dump, in Gadda's song, we see an example of how Gadda compensates, so to speak, you know, the, the discrimination or the, the rejection that Dalits, or for that matter, animals, face in a caste society. So how Gadar kind of aestheticizes these rejected things and uh, people who are rejected at out, as outcasts and so on. So thank you so much. Yeah, over to Abhilash again. Thank you. A <clears throat> uh, couple of things about uh, Yohanan's songs. Um, they have no access to printing press because this movement started in the early 20th century. So the Yohannan propagated his ideas through songs, which are not written songs orally. Okay. Now one interesting aspect of these songs is it almost all the songs evoke very strong memories of uh, slavery. Very strong memories. Even today, if you visit their congregation's church, uh, just like Christians, every Sunday they come together, the followers of Yohannan, and then they speak about slavery. They speak about how hard, the, the, the hardships that the, their ancestors lived through. Uh, in one of the songs, uh, Yohannan says, uh, the landlord came to inform their slaves. It's a family actually. There's a father, mother, and one or two children are also there, that they have been sold to somebody else. So people have come to buy them. He has already received the money, payment for their, his slaves. And uh, the, they know they cannot resist it. Okay. So then the mother takes the, the youngest child, who is just hardly one year old, and tries to feed her and tells the elder one, that uh, I am leaving, we will never meet. And then uh, the landlord allows her to feed, breastfeed the child. Okay, so this is a very, very emotional. And today, they sing the song and they all cry. It's not, uh, <laughs> it's not like uh, any religious practice or anything. They can actually feel it. So this is the power of songs. You know, you can see how. Uh, brilliantly he used the imageries or the images of 
the slavery which they did not experience the people who address they did not experience slavery it's their collective memory okay so he evokes these memories through his songs wherein they can actually feel the the hardships of the slavery that their ancestors suffered and that unites them stronger than caste and i can tell you that this is the only uh, the religious movement in in kerala wherein people from all dalit communities irrespective of their caste join and marry each other caste is not an issue at all for them because for their for them their identity is slavery we are the children of the the people who suffered slavery that unites them so caste doesn't matter to them so this is the only movement where they don't talk about the caste differences among them so the the the, the people of the you know the current generation if you look at them their fathers are from one caste mothers are from different caste there are tribes there are dalits there are obcs but they all came together and and they all feel it so uh, there are hundreds of songs and i mean i cannot sing those songs but at least one song raju has been asking me to sing one and as i said told you earlier when i was speaking to you i told you that the title of the the book no alphabet is in sight is taken from yohannan song only okay so i will read that song for you uh so this is his critical position on uh, christianity bible actually okay so see how he looks at uh, bible so he says no not a single alphabet is seen i read the bible no not a single alphabet is seen there in this sacred book on my race it's a long poem but i have taken only few lines so many histories are seen on so many races scrutinize each one of them the whole histories of the world not a single letter is seen on my race so this is where he says that you need to keep this book elsewhere and he actually uh, very sarcastically says that we should send it back to the jews <laughs> please send it back it's not your history it's their history let them read and once again i would like to tell you that this criticism does not come from the 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 right wing politics that you experience today okay he was not against christianity he was against the idea that his people should not be practicing a religion which does not talk about them okay uh, so again coming back to songs um, they had no printed text so they handed down these uh, history and their subjects and everything through songs only only recently they started printing and uh, their songs and literature and what so there uh so uh okay so once again i would like to reiterate before handing the mic to uh, handing over to reju that uh, if you look at the songs of pagel yohannan or prds almost all the songs evoke the memory of slavery which is their core subject and their followers can still feel it and that unite them as a community right so more than dalit or scheduled caste or madiga mala pule or paraya what unite them is the the memory of slavery and so it doesn't matter which caste they belong to they feel they are one they came from the same family that's it purna and then we can probably uh, have questions if there are uh, one of the reasons why uh, like it's easier probably to remember things and pass it on from one generation to another so uh, as i was saying the folk tradition uh, the songs that we associate with uh, all kinds of uh, agrarian activities uh, hard physical labor etc so there is always that tradition of songs with the dalit communities so there are instances like uh, you know um, a dalit pastor falls into a pit you know uh, while trying to escape an attack from the syrian christian or the upper caste community because that was common in kerala like uh, dalit christians uh, along with missionaries or even otherwise they would uh, try to worship sing songs and they will have their sheds which would work as their uh, church that would get burned down by the upper caste so they would run away so he falls into a pit and then he writes a song 
and he says i fell into a deep pit i fell to bottom my savior saved me and lifted me from the pit so this is uh, again say from the history of uh, salvation army uh, in kerala and there is another instance where this uh, believer a dalit christian believer goes to a syrian christian pastor and the syrian christian pastor makes fun of him even invoking the bible uh, see uh, he says can an ethiopian change his color and can a leopard remove its spots what testimony do you have to offer so that's a question so instead of feeling bad about it obviously you feel bad about such a comment but instead of just leaving that incident like that this person uh, philippos the vetamela philippos who is uh, incidentally from my hometown uh, he actually uh, sings a song which says when the son of uh, justice comes in his radiance i would be cleared of my black color in his second coming i'll be seated beside him like a king so what you can see is in those dalit christian songs from the colonial times in kerala we could see that it is not just uh, converting to christianity for material benefits but it's also a spiritual act so they are deliberately uh, say refuting all kinds of arguments that would Uh, limit an understanding of dalit conversions as for material benefits and they're actually uh, trying to understand this at the religious spiritual level as well so uh, it doesn't matter what the serene christian says it doesn't matter what uh, the upper caste says uh, you know i will be uh, you know liberated i will be saved i'll get redemption in jesus is the idea so we have several such instances i think even in uh, uh the early uh, novel slayer slain which was uh, written um yeah uh, by madam collins who was the wife of a uh, a missionary in travancore we have such characters so we often have such characters dalit christian characters in dalit christian works the early works at least where they talk about you know how faith actually helps them move through these kinds of difficulties and it's you know how they Uh, even forgive the upper caste for the atrocities i'm not talking about contemporary dalit writers i'm not talking about the late uh, 19 and, and, and say 1990s or uh, 2000 writers but i'm talking about say 70s or 80s so there was such representation so again uh, we at times uh, we at times dismiss of the 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 conversion experience uh, because we take it more as a political thing as well in contemporary times but Uh, there are other dimensions to it is what uh, is clear from such instances faith was a definite question so even when i looked at uh, some of the missionary writings from the period you also have the other side where the missionary would say you know how the dalits were all happy and eager to convert which may look as if they are writing for the 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 funding uh, from england but uh, at times you should also see the other side where the lived experience of uh, christianity by the lower caste uh, communities uh, and if you look at the contemporary times you can also see how several dalit christian churches especially pentecostal ones have emerged in kerala and if you look at uh, uh, such churches pentecostal churches they also defy the syrian christian tradition of uh, bishops and uh, you know having uh, ornaments and such things and which leaves that kind of a tradition this upper caste tradition but even there you have now upper caste pentecostals and lower caste pentecostal churches uh, so there are segregations but there are also ways in which these songs have i would say helped uh, you know keep these memories alive so in the case of prds and yohannan and in the case of uh, dalit christians in kerala thank you uh, i'm a little conscious of the time so i think uh, we can take some more questions but before that i think i'll take up the privilege and ask you a question <laughs> so um reju did mention about the liberation theology and so on it was a strong movement in latin america because you know uh, revolutionaries actually they inter- reinterpreted christianity rather they said that you know jesus doesn't want you to go to heaven and live a better life jesus wants very much wants you to have a very material and decent life on this earth so this radical reinterpretation of christianity as 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 um as you talked about i mean how was the established church 
um, how did the established church, uh, Christian establishment rather react to it? I mean, were there attempts to kind of um, kind of uh, delegitimize them or ban them or what there, I mean, how was the reaction? I would like to know. Thank you. Caste practices was very, very much there in all the churches, Christian Christian churches. But at the same time, uh, some churches were more inclined to accommodating the, the converts. Uh, like the CMS, for example, uh, unlike the Roman Catholic Church, they were more accommodated. Okay, but at the same time, I won't say that there was no caste. Okay, like even today, if you look at the caste practices in Christian churches in Kerala, you can see that marriages between Syrian Christians and uh, the lower caste Christians are not happening there. You can hardly find any uh, uh, Dalit Christian priest. There is no bishop, no priest. And obviously, uh, there are separate churches for uh, Dalit Christians, right? But when it comes to Yohannan and his movement, uh, he was well respected in the Christian circle, in fact, as a preacher. But that was not his issue. His issue was with the text itself, the very idea of practicing Christianity. Okay, He did not find... Uh, the history of his people in this text. When you are telling your people that you read Bible, okay, you can achieve redemption. How is it possible? So his question was: It's a it's a history of Jews, right? How they were enslaved and redeemed, right? So what's the point in my people reading this text? You give it to them, let them worship. I appreciate the fact that it is written, but give it to them. Let's find out our history. What happened to our ancestors? They were enslaved. We need to understand that. How are you going to achieve redemption? You are not going to achieve redemption by reading the history of somebody else. That was his issue. His issue was not just about untouchability alone. He used actually those issues to bring his people from those churches and start his own. Just to add one thing. I think there's also that incident which, uh, uh, I don't know whether it's accepted history or not, but there is a story that Apachan even burned uh, the Bible. Yeah, so that is there. So uh, doing that at a time when uh, you have the, you know, you have three at least major missionary organizations working in Kerala, or at least two in this particular princely state itself. I mean, that's, I don't know whether it's... Uh, uh, brave or revolutionary or uh, foolish a bit uh, but uh, like there are I mean his character in that sense you know uh, if you read uh, some of the historical accounts there were enquiries about him uh, the British uh, intelligence was looking at him uh, there were allegations that he had connections with the Germans even so there were there, there's a lot of uh, I would say conspiracy theories and uh, there are all these stories uh, but yeah uh, and as he said, songs in that sense uh, helped the movement, songs. And there are also, interestingly, there are also, I would say, certain other uh, trajectories. There is the mainstream PRDS movement, then you have other kinds of uh, uh, smaller movements that came out of this. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting kind of a thing. And uh, one should also understand, as I said, in uh, colonial Travancore, when uh, Syrian Christians enjoyed all the benefits of upper caste uh, in the society, and you have to do something like this. Uh, Apachin has also been to the assembly uh, before the king, and he has negotiated there. So he was not just a religious leader also, I would say. He was also, in that sense, a community leader who had his place uh, in the political scene as well. So, yeah. Still, whether the Bible is still uh, considered as a sacred one, because uh, according to your mentioning that uh, there's nothing about my community in the Bible. Why should I, uh, uh, why should I accept it as a sacred book? Or why should I pray for that? That, that was uh, one, one thing. Then what's happening now? And similar kind of uh, social discrimination still continuing in Christianity in Telugu states also. The similar thing. And uh, an upper caste Christian never accept uh, uh, a marriage 
wedding mm-hmm. with the dalit community similar the caste retain there in the christianity a dalit christian kamma christian reddy christian all these things are remaining then in that condition what is happening in kerala now and he mentioned that in the vasco de gama period the christianity entered whether it no 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 st thomas thomas st thomas that is a 2000 years the, it's not proved at all it's a, it's only a myth it's going on it's a very strong myth it's a very strong myth no, i said uh, even before the visit of vasco de gama vasco de gama i'm i'm quite familiar with the civil christian community and um, so what i find interesting is this johanan uh, chap Travis. No, 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 chap. This this man who uh, says give back the Bible to the Jews, but does he take up Vedic Hinduism? What does he do? No, no, does he become no, Muslim? No, no. Does he become uh, <laughs> so he continues in the Christian faith or not? I'll answer that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you have mentioned that they are not minorities now. And uh, do you have a figure? At least what is the percentage of Christians there? No, I'll answer. Okay. She asked whether Yohanan and his people went back to Vedic tradition. they never came from vedic tradition and they were therefore they did not go to vedic tradition they never claimed hindu identity also they in fact claimed the dravidian identity which is the identity of the you know the the, the land so yohanan came from Christ. he started his uh, career or life as a christian preacher uh, because that was only available resources and his people were already in uh, churches maybe that could be one reason why he went to church he had to preach bible and then get them from there now if you're talking about the current situation the caste discrimination is as cruel as anywhere in india in kerala but there is this wrong notion that kerala is a very modern state people are very advanced and everyone speaks british english better than nicol and <laughs> this is a notion that i don't know uh, there, there is this very yeah and there is is a notion that uh, kerala is a very rich state there is no poverty like everybody has a phd and things like that but that's not true if you go there you will understand that uh, caste is very very much there very strong and somehow people don't talk about it maybe because of the left background they try to hide it yeah i have seen that in campuses also here right they try to hide that fact but it's very much there maybe i'll i'll ask you the question you mentioned that Uh, the linguistic modernity where uh, dalits were adapting the language of uh, syrian christians and i'm basically <coughs> perhaps weaving their narratives in their language so i just wanted to know uh, a little more about it in terms of uh, how did the whole thing pan out in terms of social negotiation between the syrians and the dalits like what were what was their reaction was their rejection and also what were the kind of narratives uh, especially uh, when they adapted this strategy to uh, uh, use the language in that sense basic and if you can mention any instance where some song was like standing out during that period uh, organized by the matua community uh, um, uh, a, a periodical was being produced and it was Uh, a job that was being done by a lot of people who were not from matua community so they downloaded uh, from internet a photo of harichat thagur by mistake it was realized during the proof reading they downloaded a photo of poikil appachan uh, both of them were found uh, almost in the similar kind of iconography uh, sitting cross legged on the floor with a white cloth on them so my first question is uh, a lot of time matua community also face this question uh, because of this iconography uh, so i think this is somewhere an extension of uh, anush question uh, right so is there a, an attempt to break this iconography so if you can uh, talk about that and the second is uh, it's particularly about those songs that we said you see uh, again matua community a lot of these songs uh, are played with instruments which are very uh, common in the hindu festivals the metrical pattern of the songs the rhythms also emulate a lot of uh, you know dominant caste hindu ritualistic songs so how what was happening with poikil appachan the few that i have heard through youtube and all uh, 
so I have very less idea. So is there a change from you know, early 19th century, 20th century till now? Was it like you know Christian influence or how is it? So if you can comment on that. In India, upper caste people converted to Christianity for material benefits. Whereas uh, lower caste people, uh, they converted to Christianity to escape from being enslaved or uh, to, to escape from caste discrimination. But now we have, as uh, one of our friends has mentioned, uh, we see people belonging to different caste. They go to same church, but they have their own groups in terms of their caste. Why is it? I mean, uh, why is this integration is not taking place? You know, you know, conceptually, this Christianity is egalitarian in terms of its concept. Uh, why this? You know, I can't say that, but okay. Uh, to a great extent, we can say that you know it has failed to integrate people. Uh, I, I would like to know that. Uh, Yohanan passed away in 1939. Okay, so till then, uh, the the practices were very different in the PRD's movement. But uh, you know, after India became independent and became a republic, <coughs> uh, after we implemented the first uh, preservation policies things started changing because this community did not have a, any Christian, they did not have a Christian identity as such, but they were not Hindus, right? But then the reservation is reserved for only Hindu scheduled caste. So they were left with no choice but to, you know, uh, accept Hindu identity. And what was the best way? Change the image of Yohanan. So Yohanan was called Apachan. Apachan means Appan, father till at that point. So suddenly, in 1950, they changed all the terminology. Apachan became Gurudevan, Gurude, Sri Kumara Gurudevan, okay, which is a Hindu guru. He was never called Gurudevan when he was alive. But after 1950, the terms started changing. He became Poigil Sri Kumara Gurudevan, a Hindu sadhu and circulated then people started using it. So unless they do that, unless they claim that Hindu identity, they won't be eligible for scheduled caste or scheduled tribe reservation. So that is the reason. And you asked me another interesting question about the songs. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the you know, recent songs, it's more inclined towards, you know, Karnatic and all that. Whereas Yohannan songs are very powerful political poems. So there is a difference. I do. Uh, accept that. Okay. What was the next question? Was there any uh, uh, Christian influence in the earlier composition? Of course, it's there. Yeah. He used biblical themes, stereology, in fact, to yeah. explain the, you know, uh, what slavery was and how you can accept, uh, achieve redemption. He used that Christian theology. Theology is biblical, Christian, but at the same time, the uh, what he spoke about was the slavery in Travancore, not the slavery of the Jews. But Jesus at last, I promise. Yeah. <laughs> uh, was it like, uh, also thinking about the composition in the sense, influence of choir or hymns, you know, the mystical pattern? Very much there, actually. Christian influence is there, yes. No, no, they are scheduled caste now. Oh, yeah. There are scheduled tribes also, the community. Yeah, it depends on their caste. So this is my question, before becoming a slave, or when they became slaves, were they already Christian or were they Hindu or Muslim? No, when they were slaves, they had no religious identity. So they came from somewhere? No, I don't think they were allowed to practice Hinduism. They were unseeables, in fact. Yeah, but what was their background? What? Uh, they were Dalits, right? Dalits yeah, you're asking about the caste? Yes. Yeah, they were Pulayas. Yeah, caste, at, caste was there, but religion caste is was there. not a concern. Pulayas and Parayas mostly, Kuravas. Yes. Very, actually, there are very few OBCs in this movement, like Iravas and all, very few. Insignificant, actually, the number is So my question is, did they become then Christian under the Syrian Christian slave masters? Some Once again, uh, sorry. These, these slaves, did ah. they become Christian because of their Syrian Christian slave masters? Yeah. 
exactly yeah, so yeah, yeah. Of, they encourage them very few like your yeah yeah very few all. but the syrian christian landlords encourage them to accept christianity yeah. no? because i know that syrian christian churches don't accept dalits in, yeah. in most of them yeah they don't accept one of them. my friends syrian christian wanted to marry a french girl they were not allowed this was 30 years french back. girl and then french girl okay. christian girl then think about dalits <laughs> in a dalit church no they have been married in a dalit church so oh. you know why social process is like this that when the when different caste people are converted to christianity the upper caste the lower caste persons are the dalits they move to christianity to lose their caste identity and to become the higher become into the higher social order living up living back their social uh, status sir, which came along with their caste hmm. but when the upper caste people moved into christianity they want to retain the both if at all some benefits are there with the, from, from the christianity they want to have it and at the same time they want to retain the social benefits which are there in the name of the higher caste maybe in the same social process it is going on in kerala also. of course it's answer the last question first why caste continues i'll just mention um, you know the way i understand it from the kerala context one of the reasons is that for syrian christian community what mattered the most was their uh, say origin story the legend of saint thomas was so important for them not because saint thomas was actually um, uh, whatever but the point was that he converted uh, he's believed to have converted people from several brahmin families so syrian christian communities in general have that uh, kula purana where they you know trace their origin to one of these uh, uh, brahmin families so that is one of the reasons why that history of saint thomas is very important because it is through conversion of brahmins that uh, you know the community started and it's also like during my phd i was looking at uh, histories of, you know by several syrian christian churches in kerala even when uh, most of these histories uh, as per the churches they claim that it is believed that saint thomas uh, converted but still that that memory is something that they keep alive because that serves a purpose in kerala especially in colonial kerala when they could use public road to public transport to all kinds of they could get all the benefits of an uh, upper caste uh, and there are studies that talk about them uh, as having the same status like the uh, nayars in kerala so that they would definitely not want that uh, to be lost and that's also another reason why till the anglican uh, till the portuguese in 16th century and the anglican missions in 19th century you don't have syrian christians converting dalits or any other community into their fold because they don't want to uh, you know mix and lose their uh, special status and even during the colonial times when the anglican missions converted dalits into christianity there are instances of syrian christians jumping through the windows of churches when uh, dalit christians were brought into the church because they they followed purity uh, and all kinds of such rituals uh, as per the upper caste standards in kerala so uh, and that's also another reason why we still have the segregation when it comes to um weddings alliances etc but right now people do dalit christians and syrian christians do worship together in several churches but when it comes to wedding there is still a no no on this another thing mentioning the language the syrian christian churches traditionally have this uh i mean they have this tradition of using syriac as a language of their liturgy which again um, it was not a very commonly used language say by the church going syrian christians but the priests probably the sexton and certain other people in the church would use the language but uh, that was the language of the liturgy and that's also another reason why there are other churches like mathoma syrian church which is a reformed church and how did this reform happen with the anglican missionaries in kerala uh, the the malangara syrian churches they had this question uh about the need for a reform and there was a committee which was formed to look at the need for this reform and the committee recommended these reforms and the church refused the uh, the reforms and the committee walked out and they started the marthoma syrian church which is anglican in uh, many of its ethos principles etc but they still hold on to the syrian tradition which still 
you know upholds the uh, the brahminical uh, you know conversion of brahmins in its history so so it it's a complex thing in that sense so you have the language of liturgy which is different as opposed to the language of uh, liturgy in the uh, in the missionary church which could be english or uh, we have uh, malayalam also being used again uh, coming to the next part the question of uh, linguistic modernity how did syrian christians deal with say these kind so many of these songs that dealt with uh, the slave experience and uh, such caste oppression etc they were not uh, you know very popular with the syrian christian community but there are other songs which would again lose its political uh, edge or social edge uh, in the syrian christian circles so there are such songs but again one thing about the syrian christian uh, hymns and uh, songs would also be the fact that we had a lot of uh, songs written in the carnatic uh, format with a lot of ragas and such things being taken care of and that is where also the the fact that the the drum the para the tambar that we refer to as in malayalam uh, becomes very important because that is again a caste symbol uh that is again uh, going against the the kind of uh, say the discipline structured uh, liturgy worship songs etc in a syrian christian church and that go that, that is not what you may have in a dalit christian church especially in dalit pentecostal churches where people would be jumping beating the drums and singing and uh, so that so the, the the worship the liturgy all of these things are different in that sense so there is a lot of uh, difference if you nitpick but there is a lot of amalgamation as well uh, and that's why i said so you also have dalit pentecostal churches which attracted a lot of syrian christians in some way or the other even the churches that uh, ablash, e- even in prds there are some instances of syrian christians right very very rare but there are and if you talk about the post independent uh, or uh, the uh, post 1947 period you can also see that the cms church which came uh, say which was formed uh, putting together all the missions anglican missions working in in kerala you can also see that even there those syrian christians who associated with the missionaries later became dominant in the cms uh, church csi church sorry and there were protests within the csi church against this kind of a syrian christian domination which later led to a church called the cms church which claims that we are the original uh, tradition of the missionaries so they talk about colonial modernity its principles etc so it's a very complex uh, thing with many of the syrian churches whether they believe this or that they still believe in the brahmin conversions and a lot of dalit churches groups which uh, you know try to invoke the uh, the anglican understanding of uh, christianity uh, egalitarianism well being etc etc so and even the missionary discourse is not a completely um, you know pure black and white kind of i mean it's not i mean it's not just a binary you have all kinds of voices within the missionaries as well there are accounts of anglican missionaries opposing uh, say uh, certain uh, anglican missionaries because they were being too friendly to the natives yes. uh, there was also one instance of an anglican missionary marrying a i think a pulaya girl which was opposed by the anglican missionaries other anglican missionaries because so there are all of these things so it's not just a clear uh, you go with anglican so you hate syrian christians there's a lot of give and take there's a lot of uh, and again you cannot ignore the colonial nature that's what abla started with so you should also understand how when slavery was banned how like cj fuller has uh, studied this the plantation labor in uh, kerala and how abolition of uh, slavery helped uh, say um, uh, get people for these uh, plantations labor for these plantations like the endangered uh, laborers so so it, it's it's a mix of all of those things so as i said uh, even now Uh, i i remember like uh, whenever i used to go to church uh, you know uh, when you have the priest you have the normal uh, liturgy and the worship and on days when the priest is not there you have you may not even have uh, everyone coming to the church because anyway the priest is not there second thing the mode of worship would change you would bring the uh, the para the drum the tambar not with the leather anymore but with plastic but still there are associations so you don't Uh, like appreciate it so much 
so there are all these uh, memories and histories uh, intricate in it thank you devam sate Uh, if any adivasi writer is interested uh, please do reach out to hbt or south side group